Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the Semmel Healthy Campus Initiative Center at UCLA's 2022 Information Literacy and Media Summit. Today, we aim to be bold and dream about how we can strengthen our common vision of fostering health and well being and building a culture of health at UCLA, in the UC system, and beyond. Specifically, the goal of the summit is to brainstorm on how universities can support a healthier and flourishing community with respect to information and media. We're so excited you all have joined us today. And now I am honored to introduce Vice Provost and Professor Roxy Cohen-Silver, who is the Vice Provost for Academic Planning and Institutional Research and a distinguished professor in the Department of Psychological Science the Department of Medicine, and the Program in Public Health at the UC Irvine. Her research on the impact of media exposure on our health will be vital for setting the stage for today's conversations. Welcome, Roxy. Thank you so much for the invitation. I am a stress and coping researcher who has been studying how individuals and communities respond to adversity for over 40 years. We first noticed the importance of the media in the aftermath of the Columbine High School shooting, which was the first community tragedy that received widespread media attention. In those early days in the late 1990s, our attention was focused on the impact of intrusive media on survivors of disaster. But after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, we learned more about the important role of the media in coping with tragedy. At that time, our television sets were bombarded with nonstop coverage of the attacks and their consequences. We learned from early work conducted in the aftermath of 9-11 that the amount of television news individuals watched in the days after the attacks was associated with both acute and chronic stress responses. Early media exposure was also linked to new onset cardiovascular and other physical ailments two to three years later. The recognition that a local event could become national and have mental and physical health consequences was underappreciated 20 years ago. But of course, the media landscape has changed dramatically in the past two decades. People now carry very powerful cameras in their pockets and their handbags and can take videos of community tragedies and post them rapidly to social media without being moderated by an editor, which results in local events becoming international ones in minutes. Note the 2019 massacre in two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, which the perpetrator live streamed on Facebook. Here in Southern California, we could learn of this tragedy within minutes. Our research after the Boston Marathon bombings, the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando, Florida, and other community-wide disasters has provided us with information about the role of both traditional and social media in our psychological response to collective traumas. Over the past several decades, increasing amounts of research have demonstrated that both the frequency and the graphic content of media portrayals of natural and man-made disasters can have important consequences for our mental health. Moreover, anxiety that is associated with increased media exposure appears to draw people in to greater media exposure after the next tragedy, leading to a cycle for which it is very difficult to extricate ourselves. During the pandemic, journalists began to call our tendency to become immersed in bad news as doom scrolling, where people click from one link to the next, reading story after story about tragedy. With hours of unscheduled time on our hands and pandemic-related re restrictions on our activities, there was no shortage of bad news all the time. And people spent a great deal of time immersed in media stories about the devastation of the pandemic, the George Floyd murder and belated racial reckoning, the economy and growing inflation, 
climate-related disasters, political polarization, and now the war in Ukraine. My research team has found that media exposure to this onslaught of cascading collective traumas has had negative psychological consequences that are even more potent than knowing someone who died of COVID or contracting the illness oneself. In addition, we have learned that exposure to conflicting information in the media is particularly stressful. Today's event will help us explore what we can do to protect our mental and physical health in the context of constant media stories of tragedy that are told in ways specifically designed to keep us engaged. How can we encourage people to temper their media consumption of adversity? How can we address misinformation and disinformation that spreads rapidly on social media? How can we encourage media companies to take responsibility for the graphic content they offer on their platforms? How can we encourage young people to disengage from doom scrolling, to focus on more productive ways to address the situation in our country at this time? These are challenging times to be sure. And our institutions of higher education are the ones that are best able to collect the science and inform our policymakers, our healthcare professionals, and the public at large. Thank you for offering me the opportunity to share these comments. Wow, that's extraordinary, Roxy. Thank you so much for sharing some of your trailblazing research on the health impacts of media exposure. And you've left us with so many questions to answer that we will have plenty to talk about, I believe, in our uh, breakout sessions. And so now I have the pleasure of introducing Vice Chair for Graduate Studies and Professor in the Department of Psychology at UCLA, Ted Robles. He is also the co-leader of the Engage Well pod with Dr. Chris Dunkelshedder for the Semo Healthy Camp Campus Initiative Center at UCLA. Welcome, Ted. Thanks, Wendy. And it's great to see so many familiar faces, including Roxy. Um, so the organizers asked me to talk about the impact of misinformation on social well-being. And I want to say that there's still a lot that we don't know. There's still a lot of data that needs to be collected. And so what I'm going to talk about here is really based on existing ideas and concepts that have existed for a while in sociology and communications and psychology. And I'm going to make three points. So the first is that sharing information builds social bonds and it's rewarding. We share stories, we share information to help people, to get a sense of whether people value our identities, value our values, and care about us as people. And we do the same thing for others. When someone shares information with us about themselves or something like that, if we, when we value that, we communicate that we understand them and we care for them. And those bonds help form the social resources and structures that allow us to function as a society, to cooperate, to coordinate. It's what sociologists describe as social capital. And there's several kinds of social capital. There's bonding capital, which are the connections that you have with people who are similar to you, like your families or people from the same culture, your in-group. There's bridging capital, which are the connections that you have with people who are different from you, who come from different groups, different cultures that you might see at work or in the community. These are your connections with your out group. And then there's linking capital. So these are the connections that we have with people who are at different levels of power and influence in our social hierarchy. The managers, the supervisors, the politicians, the leaders up above us, and the folks that we supervise or who we, who we are responsible for uh, who might be below us on the social ladder. Now, as we're gonna talk about, misinformation has existed forever in the form of gossip. Some of you might remember chain letters that you would put in the mail or chain letters that you would email to people. But what makes things different today is my second point, which is uh, this idea of pervasive awareness afforded by social media that Roxy uh, alluded to. This is an, a concept from communications research. So both the pervasive awareness, which is the idea that, you know, in the old days, if I had a chain letter and I sent it through email, um, I don't really know if, if the people that I sent it to thought it was funny, thought it was important, or if they sent it to other people. But in today's social media, if I share something on Facebook, I get continually notified about how many likes it receives, and I see all the comments. 
And when you combine that pervasive awareness with the incentive structures that focus on superficial and highly charged engagement, this sharing of information, which was already reinforcing, becomes even more reinforcing because of likes and retweets and so on. And so this information ecosystem that relies on these quick hits of social reinforcement are part of the reason why uh, the social psychologist Jonathan Haidt at NYU, he, he recently described in an article in Atlantic that these new features in social media are a contributor to why the past 10 years of American life have been uniquely stupid. That was the title of his article. Because once misinformation makes its way into our information ecosystems, it spreads and it becomes reinforced incredibly quickly. So the third thing I wanna say is what does this mean? What does this misinformation then do to our social capital? Well, let's think about bonding capital, the connections with people who are in your in-group. Well, the more they start to seem different from you, the more urgent it becomes for us to sever ties with them. If my cousin doesn't agree with my views on vaccines, I'm gonna unfriend them, I'm not gonna follow them, I'm gonna mute them. I don't wanna have anything to do with them anymore. Misinformation becomes a, a, a obstacle to bridging capital. It reduces opportunities to engage with people who are different from us because we strongly believe they are very different and, and wrong and evil. And whatever engagement does happen online and in Instagram or Twitter becomes less substantive. We're just making comments so that other people can like them or, or agree with us, but it's not real engagement. And what about linking capital? Well. Linking capital, uh, misinformation reduces our trust in people with power. Conspiracy theories have a way of doing that. And they also have a way of reducing our trust in people with less power. So we have trust that's reduced up and down um, the social ladder. What does this do? This drives us into both our virtual bubbles as well as actual bubbles like where we live and work. These are places where we feel safe. Our identities and values are shared and they're understood and we're rarely criticized. There's bonding capital there, but it centers around falsehoods or perpetuating resentment and distrust of others. And our views go unchallenged and underexamined. Um, the sociologist Zainab Tufekci from UNC wrote a few years ago, actually, that the idea that belonging becomes stronger than facts. And we stop participating in institutions and put less faith in those institutions. So I'll end by saying that in addition to teaching people how to separate fact from fiction, which we definitely should do, um, we also need to counter this pervasive, quick hit social virtual interactions with in-person settings and situations where people can encounter, discuss, and work through misinformation in a slow and deliberate way. So thanks for allowing me to make these comments and uh, look forward to the rest of today. Thank you, Ted, so much. We're so grateful for your leadership in supporting social well-being in person for our Bruin community and beyond. Um, and some really great advice for all of us. Uh, and now with great respect, I'd like to introduce Professor and Associate Dean Emily Falk, who is a Professor of Communication, Psychology and Marketing and the Associate Dean for Research at the Annenberg School at Penn. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. I have really fond memories of graduate school at UCLA, and it's fantastic to be part of this meeting. And it was exciting to see the mission of the Semmel Healthy Campus Initiative being to create a culture of health for the 85,000 students and faculty and staff and visitors at UCLA. Because um, one of the things that we know from decades of research, including research by my team, is that culture comes in part from the stories and ideas that people share with one another. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about how the stories that we share and that spread at scale in society um, can motivate action, can change how the brain processes information, and can actually help people get in sync, building on what Ted was just talking about. So to give you a sense of what I mean, I'd like to actually introduce you to another UCLA grad who I met in 2015 as part of a PopTech fellowship. This is Raj Jayadev, who is the founder of Silicon Valley Debug, which is an organization that uses storytelling as a form of community organizing to advocate for change in the criminal justice system and other places. And in a really beautiful TED talk that I really recommend, Raj tells a number of stories. One of them is about Carnell, who was a dad facing a five-year prison sentence for a low-level drug charge. And Carnell wanted to be there for his daughters. Um, and the team at Debug gave him a camera to document his day-to-day -day life, taking care of the girls, cooking for them, taking them to school, picking them up from volleyball practice, 
And in this way, he was able to share his story through that lens in court and help the judge understand his day-to-day -day life in a different way. And instead of a five-year prison sentence, Carnell was able to get a six-month outpatient program and be there for his kids. So building on this idea that stories can help us understand other people's lives and motivate action in a different way than cold facts, at the start of the pandemic, my PhD student, Mary Andrews, who you see here, was also particularly concerned about how we could stop the spread of the virus and keep ourselves safe and also protect people in our society whose life circumstances put them at particularly high risk for getting COVID. So we wondered if stories could help people understand the risks that people like healthcare workers and people who are incarcerated disproportionately faced. So to study this, we randomly assigned different groups of volunteers to either read messages framed as stories or messages that had the same information but were just given as cold facts without the story. And what we found was that stories made the volunteers online feel more transported into the message and in turn, this motivated action. They reported being more aware of the risks that other people were facing in the pandemic, more willing to change their own behavior to prevent the spread of COVID, more likely to do things like donate money to help other people. And other research shows that stories can also help us understand other people's perspectives and importantly, not only shape what we think about, but also how our brains do that thinking. So as a neuroscientist, I run a lab that studies what happens in the brain when people are persuaded to change their minds, change their actions. And my team and other people have found that stories are processed differently in the brain from other kinds of information. So in one study that my former postdoc, Jason Coronel led, we used brain stimulation that I'm uh, indicating with this little cartoon of the zapping here. Um, so it's, it's a gentle kind of brain stimulation that temporarily disrupts certain parts of the brain. And we were able to temporarily decrease activity in regions that were associated with thinking in 65 smokers. And we showed some of these smokers messages about smoking and other topics that were framed as stories. And some of the volunteers saw the same information, but just framed as cold facts. And what we found was that uh, even when we disrupted their ability to think using this brain stimulation, people who were given stories were still able to reason just as well, whereas people who were just given the cold facts were not able to reason as well. So their ability to make sense of the information was much worse. And I'm guessing that many of you may have felt like this, felt like our volunteers um, at some point in the past few years um, in terms of feeling disrupted um, through stress, Zoom fatigue, juggling all of the different priorities on our plates, competing demands on our attention. All of these things can make it harder to think. Yet, as we know from Ted's research and others at UCLA and beyond, communicating and connecting with other people is a key ingredient for our well-being. The good news is that in addition to making it easier to reason, research also shows that stories can literally bring audience brain members, uh, brains into synchrony with one another. So stories can be powerful because they spread widely, they can motivate action, they can change how the brain processes information and they can help us get in sync with one another. Now, of course, stories can motivate the kinds of helping that Mary's work highlighted or healthy choices about things like smoking, but stories can also spread misinformation and encourage health harming behaviors like we just heard about. Now, research in my group and others has shown that people share stories to express things about themselves because they think it'll be useful to others to bond. And I'm looking forward to the opportunity to brainstorm this afternoon about how we can use what this research suggests to perpetuate that culture of health and meaning and happiness at UCLA and beyond. So thank you so much for having me. Um, the citations to the papers are here and I'm really looking forward to this opportunity for conversation. Oh, wow, thank you, Emily. I'm sure everyone after each of these speakers is clapping. Uh, you're a great storyteller yourself. Uh, thanks for that. And your pioneering research on impact of storytelling on the brain. It's really tremendous. Um, so we'll now hear from our esteemed professor and Wasserman Dean of the UCLA School of Education and Information Studies, Tina Christie. 
on how we can teach media literacy and why it's important. Welcome, Tina. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you for inviting us to partner with you in this most important work. Um, the spirit of your partnership and collaboration in this work is simply exemplary, and I want to thank you for that. I also want to thank everybody who's joined us here today, our speakers and participants. Um, this is uh, such an important opportunity for us to talk about this um, <clears throat> really critical issue. So let me start my remarks by addressing the second part of the question that you posed first. Why information in media literacy is important. It seems obvious, uh, but uh, I wanna remind us that not too long ago, we could confidently say that children were socialized first by the family, then by their neighborhood, and then in the later years by the wider community. It is in those interactions in actual geographic spheres that children were raised and where they developed their beliefs, values, and worldviews. You all know well, this is no longer the case. Consider that for 12 year olds today, there has never been a time in their lives where there weren't smartphones, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Snapchat. And if that weren't enough, they are now surrounded by Instagram and TikTok, both of which I know very little about, but I assure you my 11-year-old daughter knows everything about. According to a recent study, 62% of teens say they use social media every day. 77% say they watch online videos every day. The top four sites among teens are, not a surprise to any of you here, YouTube, TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram. Today, after the early influence of the family, it is arguably the internet through which our children are socialized and through which their beliefs, values, and worldviews are being shaped. The digital platform is now the environment that they breathe. It permeates their lives, personal as well as social. And now with the pandemic, of course, their school lives. Like any other environment, it can be nourished or it can be debilitating. They will either flourish in it or flounder in it, depending on how well they respond to it. Hence, an education in how to deal with these all pervasive digital tools is, the ut is, of, uh, excuse me, is of the utmost importance our children's future depends on it. What ought to be this education? What should it consist of? First part of your question, Wendy. Much can be said here with respect to the details of curriculum. And of course, these are brief remarks. So what I'm gonna do is offer a framework for a curriculum in this area. First, I believe it's critical that we develop an awareness in children and young adults of the nefarious effects on us of the digital environment. We are beginning to understand the effects. They've just been talked about prior to my remarks. Effects such as addiction to social media, depression, reliance on snapshots, surface understandings of content, and others so well articulated already. But the awareness of these effects is not widely shared in the general population, especially amongst children and students. Second, it is essential, I believe, that we offer the appropriate knowledge and skills to both maximize the potential of this new platform and to deal with its negative and harmful aspects. These skills might include, for example, critical thinking of appropriate evaluation of digital content, mindfulness with respect to the use of digital tools, the intentional inequities in terms of access and representation of racialized and minoritized peoples, focused inquiry for deeper understanding and other relevant knowledge and skills. Third, it is important that we develop appropriate dispositions and attitudes in our students, such as responsibility, empathy, kindness, racial and gender equity, and a desire for truth, and a desire for justice, just to name a few. 
These dispositions and attitudes are the deeper aspects of the human personality. They are the springs of overt actions, and they ultimately will determine how our children and students respond to this new environment. Fourthly and lastly, it is essential that we help children and students take appropriate actions toward responsibly using digital tools. What concrete and incremental actions can children and students take? And how might educators scaffold these actions? That too is essential. These four elements, cultivating awareness of the effects of this new environment, providing knowledge and skills to navigate in this environment, cultivating noble and appropriate dispositions, and helping students take concrete actions toward responsible stewardship of the digital environment are, I believe, essential if our students are to thrive in this new environment and not wither under its weight. These elements, in, I, in my view, give meaning to the phrase media and information literacy. They also dovetail, I believe, with the questions posed in the preamble. The potential of digital media is immense for human progress, but it's also laden with dangers. The trajectory of future generations will depend on a direct and appropriate education in this area in cultivating appropriate literacies, from engendering acute awareness of the digital environment to supporting real actions. Thank you again, Wendy, for bringing us together and to address, to address these most important issues. Thank you so much, Dean Christie, for sharing your innovative strategies to build a more information resilient community. And it was really Dean Christie's team that um, they are the ones who wrote the preamble and also launched the uh, minor that is just started at UCLA in this past winter. So thank you for that. And now um, we're moving on to pre-K through 12 educational systems. Uh, Tina just teed us up for that. Um, and we will now hear from the Los Angeles Unified School District board member, Jackie Goldberg. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry I can't be here for this whole thing, but we are right now downstairs in a board meeting that I just stepped out of because this is so important. I felt it was important enough for me to leave a board meeting to speak with you. Thank we you. We passed in March of 2021 unanimously a notion that we needed to expand vastly the what we were then calling critical media literacy campaigns. Uh, I'm now interested in getting rid of the word critical and just calling it media literacy because some of the anti uh, CRT people are trying to confuse people and saying that what this is is about critical race theory. And so we're, we're going to be leaving the word critical out and just calling it media literacy because that's really actually what it is. We had hoped this year would be an implementation year, but COVID has made things more difficult. So we've done instead made this an infrastructure year. That means that we have been creating curriculum, K-12 curriculum with Discovery Ed. We work with Nusela to start smart bridge units for ninth through 12th grade in curriculum. We are also working with them to do mini lessons focused on our sixth through 12th graders. We formed a partnership with Newslet for real life examples of media literacy issues that are going on right in the world today. And we are working on with our good friend, Jeff Scher, who has been advisor to us throughout all of this process on setting up a district wide series of media a, a professional development to help them realize that they're already doing a lot of this. You know, most teachers already ask students to look at what are the sources for the information that you're getting? At least history teachers do, that's what I was. They also ask in English classes, well, how do you know this is true? So we're doing some of it, but what we wanna do is to begin an implementation year in 22-23 in which the curricula that we have already done plus the PD that Jeff Scher is helping us to roll out, we'll now begin to see a more systematic and district-wide look at media literacy. We are currently using existing course content in English, history, and the sciences. We have on the board a curriculum committee, which I chair, and we devoted one entire media, 
uh, one entire meeting, a two and a half hour meeting on the whole issue of the necessity to do media literacy. We believe in LA Unified, the motion to do all of this was done unanimously in March of last year. We believe in LA Unified that it is critical that we provide curricula and time in literally every class that students take at secondary and during their K-5 years as well. Because we believe from your previous speaker just ahead of me, they're already being inundated. I went to a middle school uh, at nutrition time the other day and saw six kids sitting together, talking to each other on their texts rather than using out loud words. At first I thought they were just texting or looking at it. I realized they were actually using the device instead of speaking out loud to each other. I was horrified. I mean, at some point, are we gonna lose language? I don't know. The point is, it's so pervasive that schools must take the responsibility for organizing, not just what teacher happens to think of doing it or what teacher does it in their curriculum already, but to organize and professionally develop teachers to be able to see that this is a part and parcel of math, it's a part and parcel of science. It's a part and parcel of English. It's a part and parcel of history. It's even a part and parcel of learning a second language because part of what's going on is a targeting of English learners in some of these media with misinformation. Particularly, we've seen this in vaccine stuff that the second language learners were targeted uh, with disinformation. So we know that this is a, an important, important issue. And I will tell you that the commitment of this board and our director, uh, chief officer, academic officer, Allison Yoshimoto Tauri is to do this in a meaningful way. And we've spent most of this year either reinforcing the people already who were doing it themselves and mostly developing new curricula and with Jeff Scher's help, a new rollout of professional development. So that's where we are. And I'm so thrilled that you're doing this conference. I really am so sorry that I can't attend all of it, but I hope that you will put out your results in some sort of document, which I'm sure you will. And I'll look forward to getting that. And thank you so much for letting me rush in. And now I got to go back to the other meeting that I'm supposed to be at. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time, Jackie, for sharing your impactful wisdoms and actions and uh, really focusing on the pre-K through 12 students. Um, it's, a criti it's critical we support information and media literacy education from the very beginning of schooling, as Jackie and Tina both pointed out. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce executive editor of the Los Angeles Times, Kevin Morita. Kevin is an award-winning journalist, former senior vice president at ESPN, and a former managing editor of the Washington Post. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks for having me, Wendy. And um, like, like Jackie, I wish I could be here for the whole time. And, and th this is such an important topic for our profession. Um, and we wanted to be part of. So I, I really thank the the educators and everybody who who values you know uh, media information literacy. You know when I was coming up in uh, as a as a journalism student, it, there was an adage that uh, everyone learned in journalism school school, and it was if, if if your mother tells you she loves you, check it out. And in, in some ways, it was it was funny and. Witty, but it, it was designed to reflect the principle that don't come to, our profession doesn't come to assumptions automatically. The things that you think you know, uh, you may not know. And uh, it was a, a really guiding principle to, to, to fact check, to verify. Um, you know, at the Los Angeles Times, we publish, you know, on average 93, pieces of journalism or content is the, the, the ubiquitous phrase today, a day. And within that, um, it's a range of, of hard news, things on deadline, features, lots of other ways for people to come to it. Um, that work is read by multiple people. Uh, lots of touches on it. It's copy edited, it's copy edited for you know, mistakes and, and uh, fairness. And, um, and then there, there are headlines. The headlines are workshop. Do they match the story? 
there's a there's a very involved process that goes on to get to the work you you see and um that process more or less it's changed over time but the los angeles times 140 years old and it stood the test of time um in this period that we've been talking about uh with the concern for new tools and social media you know it, it really reflects a digital age a digital revolution that we're all in we we take part in that you know we're on every social platform that the kids are on we're on TikTok. we we have a presence on all of the social platforms. And it's not so much the platforms, right? It's it's how the platforms are used. And, and in this era that we're in um, now, um, it's harder to distinguish fact from fiction. Um, and so one, one of the things that that we do, you know, that that differentiates from us, it's it is that you know that we we do not have bots who are maliciously uh, consciously spreading misinformation and and bringing it uh, to people for their own purposes. Our mistakes are human error. You know our mistakes are mistakes of of judgment or speed or uh, maybe we miss something. Uh, it's not out of any kind of maliciousness. One of the things in in our business. Unfortunately, it, it, with the advent of the digital age, and there's been a lot of great new startups. I was part of um, creating one at ESPN called The Undefeated, um, focused on race, sports, and culture, a new, a new platform. And, and so I applaud all of the new entrants into the media ecosystem. But we've also lost thousands and thousands of, of newspapers, hundreds right here in California, thousands right here in California the last 10 years. And that is um, really one of the tragedies of what we're talking about, uh, that we've lost so many of the traditional news organizations that, that have these values instilled in their practice. So um, one of the things that I often think about is, is when we talk about how do we, how do we combat the disinformation? Part of it is um, selfishly, we have to support those institutions that have a track record for providing really quality, um, reliable, trustworthy news. Uh, we have to support those. And that may feel like a, in some ways a, a commercial appeal uh, to people here, but it really is part of the foundation of democracy and, and the free press. Um, we have to have institutions that are going to go out and, and hold institutions accountable and, and tell stories and help to connect people to each other and to explain complex issues. Um, and unfortunately, there are a lot of people who, uh, and a lot of new entrants into the media landscape that are really not, don't have that as a mission. They have as a mission to, to try to steer people to a direction or a point of view based on conscious misinformation. Um, I think that we have to be part of, in addition to the academy and, and schools, we have to be part of our own, um, uh, solving our own problem. And, and we have to build public trust in new ways. Uh, I, I think we need more of the kind of campaigns that, that Hollywood uh, studios have for their movies uh, to really, you know, show people what we do and the value of it. And I think that's happening more and more. There are, you know, literally lots of nonprofits uh, coming in that, that have, have taken this challenge. The, the News Literacy Project is one, uh, which was uh, helmed by a former LA Times uh, staffer, Alan Miller. And it's really consciously, um, you know, works with educators and journalists to really help students, you know, get the skills they need to discern fact from fiction, fiction and to know what to trust. Um, the Trust Project, which is started by another friend of mine based out here and based in the Bay Area, uh, Sally Lerman, uh, which was, was created to amplify journalism's commitment 
you know, to transparency and accuracy, inclusion and fairness. Uh, I think transparency is a really big part of this is to let people see how do we do our work and, and that it's different from the work you can't see that just pops up on the internet. Um, and so, you know, I, I really believe that um, we have to teach this. We have to teach news literacy and make it uh, required coursework. And, and I think in public schools and private schools and starting when, when children are young and carrying it all the way through, through college, because I think it's just like history. You know, we, we have different versions of history that we teach in almost every single grade, right? All the way up through, through, through college and graduate work. There are history courses. And I think there should be news literacy courses, uh, trust courses, and the start when you're just a, a you know a, a five year old starting school uh, all the way up to because it 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 has an impact on how we see ourselves and the country and the values that we we hold dear, uh, the principles of democracy and a free press, um, and and. In, it has an impact on the public trust in government and institutions. And so um, I'm, I'm thankful for Wendy for giving me a, a few minutes here with all of you. And, and I thank all of you for your work. And um, I hope that we can continue to make progress on this topic. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. That's extraordinary. I love the idea even of backing up and teaching students about trust and uh, news literacy in pre-K through 12 as well, and um, your insightful perspectives and sage reflections on the future of the news and responsibilities of journalists too, is, and our responsibility to support the journalists, um, I think is really um, profound. And um, so we really thank you for taking the time to be here today. Uh, and uh, now, not last but not least, um, I am pleased to introduce Norman and Armina Powell, University Librarian, Virginia Steele. Welcome, Vir Virginia, Ginny. <laughs> Thank you so much, Wendy. It's great to be here, and I'm so glad you, you created this summit, and uh, we're all getting to talk about it. Of course, as you might have guessed from my title, I'm, I'm coming at this from the library's perspective. As you all know, libraries are in the information business, and we have been for a very long time. We study people's information-seeking behaviors, and we try to build collections and provide resources and expertise to help people understand and find the information they need. We teach information and media literacy. And uh, one of the things that we find is that we help socialize young people when they come into our libraries and we help build those communities. People generally, when they come into libraries, feel safe and feel as though they can ask questions. We're able to provide resources and make connections for them. So for years, librarians have built collections of materials that we select very carefully using criteria to be sure that we're both meeting the needs of our readers, but we're also getting credible sources, whether they're print materials or increasingly digital or electronic. But we do find these days it's a challenge. We are seeing, as Tina described, that teens in particular have other places they turn to first to find information, and they don't always go to the tried and true reliable sources of information. One of the factors that contributes to that in California is that California ranks last among the 48 states and the District of Columbia in having librarians in schools. In California, in 2021, there were only 811 full-time teacher librarians in K through 12 schools. That means one full-time teacher librarian for every 9,667 students. 
And as I said, it puts us at the very bottom in terms of states in the US. So students in schools don't have the opportunity to benefit from the knowledge that the teacher librarians bring and the advice and guidance those teacher librarians can provide on concepts related to media and information literacy. And unfortunately, compounding that is the fact that public libraries are also not consistently funded across California. And generally, what happens is that affluent communities fund their public libraries pretty well, but less affluent communities struggle to fund their libraries. So an example of that is Kern County. Kern County is about the size of New Jersey, but its population is larger than the population of San Francisco. It also has twice as many children. Unfortunately, in Kern County and in, in the community of McFarland, they're contemplating taking their library and transforming it into the police department because they have no other place for the police department and they don't have enough funding for their library. So they are struggling to keep a public library presence in that community. And even in Bakersfield, the central library is only open five days a week. It's not even open all seven days of the week. So when students from those communities come to UCLA, and are experiencing the, the riches of, of resources that we can provide at UCLA and are, are grappling with their studies at UCLA, they have no prior experience or very limited experience in understanding not only libraries, but really the information ecosystem that we've talked about. So in the UCLA library, we've developed a number of uh, tools that can be used. We, as Wendy indicated, we have a, a toolkit that faculty and others can use to develop um, instructional uh, sessions on information and media literacy. We in the libraries offer hundreds of information literacy sessions every year, but we don't reach every student. And that seems a great pity to me and as though we're not doing what we need to do. We're not able to equip all UCLA graduating students with the skills they're going to need to really be effective lifelong information seekers. So I'm really looking forward to our breakout sessions and to talking about how we can construct a network that will work effectively across the campus, across uh, all of our different constituencies and organizations and really try to tackle what seems to me to be a, a, a significant problem facing us for the future. So thank you again, Wendy, really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Ginny, so much and for all you do and from every speaker, because I learned something from each one uh, or more than one thing from each of the speakers. Um, Ginny, you're sharing the essential role of the library to address the challenges of information and media in our current times is so critical for us um, to move forward as we have these discussions um, in the breakout sessions. And I want to thank um, all the organizers as well for, and all the, the uh, facilitators and note takers that will be in the breakout rooms. Also want to thank Jane and Terry Semmel for their vision and continued support of Semmel HCI Center and Jane for working side by side and brainstorming and innovating with us for the past 10 years that we've been around. Um, and I will um, just thank all of the participants too that are here today uh, that will be part of this summit. Um, we aim to be bold and dream about how we can strengthen our common vision of fostering health and well being and building a culture of health at UCLA in the UC system and beyond. And specifically, the goal of the summit today is to brainstorm on how universities and uh, pre K through 12 can support a healthier and flourishing community 
with respect to information and media. And we strongly believe that Semel ACI Center at UCLA and UC wide, the Healthy Campus Network, are, we're prepared to successfully ideate and implement the solutions together. Modeling upon our past summits, we're hosting UCLA and UC wide student leaders, deans, vice chancellors, vice provosts, faculty, senior administrators, staff, and community partners to refine our campus wide goals and strategies to build a healthier or more equitable future for all. And Semel ECI Center and all of our partners will work towards meeting the summit outcomes based on our track record with other summits, such as the, our, food, our food summit in 2014, that most many of you know, but for those that don't, resulted in a food studies undergraduate minor and a food studies graduate certificate program and food literacy research projects and the teaching kitchen on campus and a Jane B. Semmel HCI community garden. And most recently the launch of the UCLA Rothman Family Institute for Food Studies. As just shared by our esteemed speakers, the misuse of tools of information and media are numerous. On the other hand, thoughtful, int intentional and innovative use of digital tools can lead to human betterment. Mm -hmm.